Hey everyone, I just saw the movie Midway, and I made a documentary about Midway, so I'm in a good position, I feel, to give you both a film critique and a historical critique of Midway. Uh, so anyways, the film is going to be broken up into those two main parts. We're going to start off with the film critique and discussing kind of the package of the film itself. So we're going to be discussing, yes, the history, but then also the plot, the acting, the sound, and the visuals. That's going to be my main package. And then we're going to be diving into a sort of chronology of the film, what it covers, and then picking out the good and the bad history embedded within. So with that being said, I'm going to be starting off by giving you my general impressions, and that is that... Yes, it's a good film. You should go see it if you're a history lover. Um, and as someone who just made a Midway documentary, I recommend it. What can I say? Um, and we'll be getting into the reasons why. So let's first start off with, you know, the, the film critique. First portion is going to be history. The main thing to be said here is that Midway is different. Uh, in most historical or inspired by true events films, it ends up being a film that takes a kernel of truth and just spins that into a fantastic narrative where, you know, like I said, there's a kernel of truth to it and you have to watch out with every scene. Uh, Midway is almost the opposite of that. I don't know, you know, as opposed to being the kernel, it's the whole corn on the cob <laughs> or whatever the expression is I just made up. Uh, what I mean by that is essentially when you see something crazy happen in the movie and you go to look it up, it turns out that it's not just a kernel that's true, it's actually going to be almost entirely true or, you know, mostly true. Um, and that is awesome. It basically ends up being a film, I can describe it in a couple ways to kind of get this point across. Uh, one of the ways I can describe this is it's like a documentary but without the maps and without the omniscient narrator. That's kind of one, t one take on it, because you do get really that, that feeling that you're retracing history th in, the, in the film. Uh, that's one take on it. Uh, the other take on it is basically, it's the type of film that you, as a history lover, or I would produce, in the sense that it just kind of follows the history, beat by beat, and it's sprinkled throughout with all sorts of history anecdotes uh, and factoids, and it's actually, this is one of the, the good things that you can say about the movie is, you learn something in this film. I just made a documentary about Midway, and I learned stuff in this film. And when I went to look it up to see if it was true, it turned out, more often than not, yes, it was true, um, over the threshold of 90%, or at least over, you know, 60%. It was always, like, mo mostly true, if you give it a meter. Um, so I thought that was impressive. So it's a movie that you can learn from, and like I said, it's kind of almost like a documentary, and it's the film that you or I would make if given a big Hollywood budget where we're like, no, I'm going to stick to the facts. And that's what you get with this movie. Uh, now that does come with some detriment to it, which leads us kind of into our next point, uh, the plot. The plot ends up being pretty surface level with just few subplots and almost no character arcs. Uh, if I could contrast this with, for instance, something like last year's Dunkirk, Dunkirk sought to portray that event from basically the ground's eye level with the overall narrative of the event taking place as backdrop. Where the story, if, if this is the camera of the film, the camera was down here and it was following the characters um, with, like I said, the history kind of setting as a backdrop. Midway is reversed. Midway has the camera up here looking at the overall narrative of what's going on. I mean, the film crams in a lot from 1937, then tracing the start of the world at Pearl, the start of the war at Pearl Harbor, then the raid on the Gilman Islands, then you have the Doolittle raid, then you have the Battle of the Coral Sea, then you have Midway. All of that crammed in together, and so the camera perspective throughout is mostly like from up here, and as it's moving and tracing these events. From a macro perspective, you do get, you know, the through lines of different characters, but you don't get the sense that the camera's down here. It's always kind of traced up here from the perspective of overall history. So like I said, that gives you a bit of a surface level feel to the characters uh, with not many subplots in the sense that they're just all running parallel, but all running parallel in the same direction of this, this historical um, trend. And no real uh, character arcs. Uh, and basically... Uh, the, the plot suffers in the sense that you're not going to get your traditional plot that engages your audience. You're more going to be engaged by just the, the narrative of it. Uh, and one of the things that is kind of... Uh, the, the main critique I'll say to this film is you're, 
you're spoon-fed exposition almost, where the history is, it's the history is splattered everywhere. Um, and the best way I could describe this is to say, assume that there's a script for the film, and it seems like I mean they did their homework. That's one of the good things you can say about the movie is they did their homework when it comes to the script. And so the script, if you can imagine it, is a long list of history factoids put in chronological order. X, Y, Z, this person said this, or this event happened, or, you know, they stack all of those up. And then what they did is for each scene, they're like, let's grab this set of factoids that happened at this date. Pull those out, get the actors in the room, and now I'm going to take this factoid and give it to you. I'm going to take this factoid and give it to you, and give it to you. Roll camera, actor one comes up, spits out factoid one. Actor two comes up spits out factoid too. So essentially that's how the film goes throughout. You'll have scenes entirely dedicated to one person just expositing his history to you or at you. So for instance, one of the things uh, is like after the, the attack on Pearl Harbor, you literally have someone stumble into the room that says, thank God they didn't get our oil reserves because otherwise we would have to retreat and you know refuel back on the mainland and then you flip to the Japanese side and they have an advisor who basically says oh my god I can't believe we didn't take out their oil reserves uh, or take out their carriers that would have set the US back let me check my notes that would have set the US back by a year you know so the, so there's these characters everywhere expositing history uh, and if it's not being said by a character then it's like eye candy in the backdrop like for instance when a, a, a ship is going by after Pearl Harbor you get to see some people you know cutting into the back of the overturned Arizona trying to rescue people so that's what I'm talking about when you're looking at the plot itself it's just people vomiting history and for me I mean lay it on me I will oh <laughs> I will bask and, and shower in that glorious uh, history vomit uh, it's awesome um, and uh, but but yeah that's that's to the detriment to the plot so you can take it both ways um, more about the plot, you know, like I said, no no real subplots, no real character arcs. It's not at all, it's not like uh, the, the film Pearl Harbor, which introduces like a, a love story. This this story has, uh, Midway has none of that. It has a little bit of like the home front with the wives who care about their husbands, but, you know, they're making sacrifices and compromises, but there, there's there's no there's no love story that's interjected in the middle. Uh, so it's it's a little bit dispassionate in that sense is what you could say about the movie. Um, which leads me into the acting. The acting is at the mercy of the plot, and so if the plot is going to be this kind of high-level plotting, tracing the narrative, the actors aren't left to work with much, and so the actors do a good job, uh, but they end up being one-dimensional. They only really hit one note, and I mean, the acting is stellar. They hit that note really well, but there's not much range to it at all, and so that's, again, another ding on this being critiqued more so as a film than as a historical piece. Um, but but still, it, the history comes on through strong, uh, and it's it's done really well. Uh, and then lastly, when it comes to like my film critique, so sound and visuals, uh, sound is pretty good. Can't have too much to say there. The musical musical score is all right, nothing too crazy. And that's kind of that's the thing with the sound and the visuals. It's kind of run of the mill big Hollywood budget film, um, where it's very, it, it's not nothing that's gonna wow you or win any awards. Um, so, for instance, the CGI is a great example. So if you take a look at the CGI, you get a lot of these shots of big battleships and fleets and, and planes moving around, and it's all super CGI heavy, which is great. I mean, they're able to portray these massive scenes and the scope and scale that you couldn't say, for instance, in the movie Dunkirk. The movie Dunkirk portrays this event that's supposed to be like tens of thousands of troops on the beach and all this stuff happening, but when you see the film, you're like, where are the, where is everyone? But what Dunkirk did well is its practical effects uh, for a lot of it. So for instance, the dogfighting seems very real and visceral and grounded, but the scope is very small, whereas Midway, the scope is enlarged, and what happens is the believability and the, the grounded nature of it kind of goes out the window. So like I said, with, when it comes to the CGI, the portrayal of the ships ends up being a little bit subpar. It looks kind of gamey. If you saw any of the trailers, I was hoping that Yes, it didn't look that great, but maybe when the film came out, there would be another edition of, um, you know, smoke effects and particles and grunge and all those layers added over the top of the, the ships and all that to make them look a little better. 
But uh, unfortunately, they kind of ended up in that state where they do look a little bit gamey. They look a little bit like they're made out of plastic uh, and not that realistic. And it kind of takes it out of you and subconsciously that takes the, 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 um, you know, the threat of when someone's on one of these ships or on one of these planes, it takes the realism out of it and it takes the edge off of some of the action scenes, unfortunately. But then again, it allows them to do these amazing action scenes. But I think they could have used at least a couple more months of work to really polish that up. Uh, so that's it overall, kind of my critique, my package of Midway as a film. Like I said, you learn something in this movie. Uh, the director has a great respect for the material. It's done super well. The sets, the props, the costumes, the acting, the, the events, all of it done super well. I learn things, like I said, and at the end of the day, um, it's, it's, the, it's the film that you and I would make as history fans. So definitely with that, uh, I can give my full recommendation to go see it. So that's it for the film critique side of it. And now let's go into the history critique. So if you haven't seen the film or if you want some surprises, um, this is where you tune out. This is going to be a little bit of spoilers. But that being said, this is, like I said, a, his, his, a, the, it's going to be a history film that sticks close to the history. So spoilers are already out there. I mean, history is history. Anyways, uh, spoilers if you, if you don't want to avoid them. Now let's get into the history. So what we're going to be doing is tracing the chronology of the film, the chronology of the history. It starts off in the pre-war years in 1937 in Japan where you have British officers stationed there before the war. You also have uh, Leighton who's going to be a naval attaché from the U.S. who's stationed there. They're discussing with the Japanese Admiralty and other forces. Uh, Yamamoto's there and this is where I knew that, oh, this film is going to take history seriously because they just start dropping those history factoids. You get a quote from Yamamoto talking about, you know, for instance, famously how if Japan goes to war with the U.S., they'll have just a year to do what they want, and then after that, you know, uh, the U.S. is going to ramp up its war uh, capabilities, and Japan stands very little chance in the long run, so they have to score an early hit. And then someone else comes in and talks about, oh, how it's a problem that Japan imports 80% of its oil, and that's why they need to spread out to Southeast Asia, Asia to grab its resources. So right from the get-go, they're just dropping history factoids and, and context at you. So that, that was good. Not much to, to gripe on there. It was done uh, pretty tactfully. And given the clip at which they're advancing, they get the facts out there pretty quickly. Uh, so yeah, after 1937, you get a cut forward basically to around the time of Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor is done decently. Um, I'll get into the pros and cons. The pros of Pearl Harbor is that when they talk about like kind of the casualties and the carnage, it's done pretty well. Uh, I like the hospital scene where they go and they try and ID the bodies and they're only able to ID a charred body because he has his graduation ring from Annapolis, which is historically accurate and a, a fine little detail to include. Uh, later, like I said earlier, you know, there's a, there's this shot of a ship going by and in the background you can see the USS Arizona flipped over with the people on top trying to cut in to get the, get the survivors. So those little things are, are pretty good about uh, Pearl Harbor. One of the detriments about Pearl Harbor is the behavior of the Japanese uh, planes coming in. A lot of the times they're shown low to the ground and a lot of damage is shown being done by these fighters strafing ground targets for some reason, and especially when you see them targeting civilians on a street, um, that's not really historically attested to. They would have relied a lot more so on the bombs and the torpedoes. You do get a couple shots on that, but uh, it's unfortunate that they have to focus so much on those strafing runs, but I understand why, because if a bomber or a torpedo plane is operating from far away, it's hard to get that good action shot to scale when those planes are far away. It makes much, it makes much more sense from like a cinema to, uh, cinematographic perspective to get the camera here, your battleship here, and the plane right in the shot. So I understand why they did it, but that's a little bit of a ding on the history. Moving forward, you then have you know, recovering from Pearl Harbor, the U.S. fleet tries to do something in response, and this is one of the things that I didn't know, that apparently the U.S. was able to trace back the direction that the Japanese planes were retreating, was able to make a deduction that the, U that the Japanese fleet was either, you know, here or here. The U.S. guesses here, find empty water, turns out Japan was up here and makes their retreat. So that was an interesting little factoid that I didn't know about and I learned about through the film. Glad that was there. Uh, but anyways, after that, U.S. is still seeking retribution. They go ahead and do a raid on the, uh, the, the, the Marshall Islands, 
and actually the it's the Marshall and the Gilbert Islands where they try and attack some Japanese garrisons there. Um, that is depicted in the film. Some cool anecdotes historically that I liked is that uh, you kind of have one of the uh, a little bit of jostling between some of the, the the pilots. One of them making a comment about how oh the torpedoes are unreliable. You can't count on them. And I love that little. Uh, fact in there because that is true. Torpedoes throughout the at least the early stages of the Second World War were notoriously unreliable. They would either fail to detonate or miss their targets or veer off course or de detonate prematurely or too late. All of those sorts of technical issues and that's actually in the film not only in the comment but actually later they do show a shot of a torpedo hitting a boat and falling apart being essentially a dud. So I love that that's included. That was a real factor that was a part of the war. Um, then part of this raid actually, so basically you have the U.S. raiding the, 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 some of the, the garrison forces, then the garrison forces from the Japanese come back and strike at the U.S. carrier. Um, the U.S. carrier and its kind of combat group shoots down some of those bombers as they're making their approach. One of the Japanese planes is going down, the pilot decides to do a kamikaze, he comes down and is aiming to hit one of the U.S. carriers when all of a sudden you have, um, let me recall his name, uh, Bruno Guido, uh, he's going to be part of the deck crew. He actually, as the plane is coming down here trying to, to uh, kamikaze, he gets into the back of a parked plane, gets on the guns, and helps to shoot down that plane, and the pilot crashes. Does hit the carrier, but doesn't take it out. And I was like, there's no way that happened. Looked it up, and it is a crazy fact. So that's what I'm talking about, another example of Midway really bringing the history to you and not spinning this little kernel of truth into something crazy. It's, you actually get the whole corn on the cob of truth. Uh, so yeah, that's the that, those are the raids. I really like that. Um, after that, you have the Doolittle raid. This one also a lot of uh, good historical accuracy. Um, they come in and they launch army bombers at extreme range, and they make it clear that there is a high likelihood that the pilots are going to have to ditch. That is all true. Uh, and then after that, when they do their raid on uh, Tokyo with the firebombing. Um, they don't show much of the firebombing, but they do make it, <laughs> they do, again, take the time to point out that the Emperor had to be taken into a, a bomb shelter, which was humiliating to the Japanese, so that's included. And then what was pretty awesome is actually they do trace the, um, the pilots of the Doolittle raid after the raid into China as they finally, you know, they ditch or they have to land or they have to make their way, and you follow actually a little bit of the story into China as they meet uh, local kind of friendly Chinese and the Japanese retaliate with bombs on that Chinese population. All that stuff, I really like that they continued that storyline a little bit further as opposed to leaving it at the bombing of Tokyo, which you'd expect. But they were committed to the history and decided to follow that storyline through, and I applaud them for doing so. So we're getting a lot of thumbs up when it comes to the history. Uh, after the Doolittle raid, Japanese is a bit shook. They start to plan on Midway. Um, then there's the Battle of the Coral Sea. Uh, it's very, very short. All you see is like five seconds of a ship burning, and that's supposed to represent the Coral Sea. Not too much to comment on there. They kind of get away with it by talking about how the U.S. has suffered a little bit. Its fleet gets knocked down a peg, and they're, oh, they're bloodied. So they play that up a little bit, whereas at the same time, the, the Japanese were bloodied and bruised up a little bit as well, which proved important. They didn't talk about that that much. Uh, so that's the Coral Sea, but then anyways, after that, that sets the stage for the buildup of Midway. Um, a lot of good stuff here, the main thing being kind of uh, Japanese and U.S. kind of machinations. So from the Japanese side, they talk about how, uh, and they show scenes of Japanese wargaming, which I was super excited about. Uh, before I knew this was even in the film, we have been doing documentaries on wargaming. Part of that was uh, an interview I did with Rob Doan from the U.S. Naval War College, the museum curator there, and we had a whole interview where we talked about the role of wargaming in the Second World War, talked about Japanese wargaming, and I was so happy to see that in the film. I fist bumped uh, when that showed up. The particular scene isn't entirely accurate the way it's depicted. The way they have it in the film basically is the Japanese are wargaming midway, one of the players representing the U.S. side comes in and says, mm, what if I put the U.S. fleet here uh, and counter ambush the Japanese ambush, which is what the U.S. did. And in the movie, uh, I believe it's Yamamoto comes in and overrules that saying that's not possible. The U.S. doesn't have foreknowledge of our presence. That's not entirely true. Uh, from what I understand, the, the true anecdote about wargaming was that it was an umpire who counteracted something that a player did, but it wasn't the fact that he positioned the U.S. fleet where it was. What he actually counteracted 
was the fact that I believe when the Japanese player had some of his ship, his planes attack a Japanese carrier, that it was a very small number of planes, and they got a very, very, very lucky hit and sunk a Japanese carrier. And that lucky strike that sunk the carrier is what the umpire actually ruled against and overruled. Um, so that's a little bit of a difference there, being the umpire overruling the sinking of the carrier as opposed to the positioning of the fleets. So that's a little bit of a, a correction right there. But I can, I can see why they wanted to put that a bit for the drama. Uh, so that's the Japanese side of preparations. On the US side, they talk about Station Hypo. I was super excited about this. We talked about code breaking and Rochefort's operation there. Super important, and what I loved is they literally introduced this by having Nimitz come down to Station Hypo and Rochefort says, hey Nimitz, wink, you know, winking at the audience, do you want to see a tour? And he's like, yeah, sure. And then they take the audience on a tour to talk about code breaking and they talk about, you know, what AF stands for, not being sure where the Japanese are going to attack. They mentioned the, the water ruse and the trap to, to associate AF with Midway and all that stuff. So that was, that was awesome. So again, more, 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 more thumbs up on the historical accuracy so far. Um, and then after that, you get into, you know, the opening stages of the Battle of Midway. Uh, it kicks off with them showing a brief scene or two with a Hollywood director who really seems out of place where he's basically on Midway. Um, but again, that's another little factoid that's true. Uh, apparently, when the U.S. was uh, planning Midway and they knew it was something that, they, that was going to be important to the war, they wanted it documented, but they couldn't tell anyone that, hey, we want something important at Midway documented because that's risky. What they ended up doing is taking this Hollywood director, sending him to Midway with the false premise that, oh, you're just going to be filming uh, the everyday life of the U.S. servicemen on the island. Turns out they were actually positioning him in a perfect uh, place to actually be able to film the traumatic battle. And we do have some, some footage of that that I believe was used in the film Tora Tora Tora, which is awesome. So we have that. Um, anyway, so that's a little bit of that. Then after that, you have some scenes of like the Yorktown that comes up to join the U.S. fleet limping along the way. People cheering the, mir the miracle of Yorktown being uh, salvaged uh, just in time. And that is, again, a historical reality. Uh, after that, you have the Japanese come and bomb Midway. Then you have Midway that counter bombs uh, Japan, or at least tries to. Uh, that's accurate. They even depict something that I omitted from my documentary, which, which is basically when one of the U.S. I believe bombers was struck and missed its target or was going down, it actually decides to try and kamikaze against the bridge of one of the Japanese carriers. Almost succeeds in doing so, and that's in the film and not in my documentary. So they did one-up me when it comes to the history. Uh, so that was awesome to see. So you get a little bit of that, then you have some scenes here and there about important moments. You have the Nautilus um, coming in, targeting the carrier group. Then you have it running away with the Arashi destroyer coming after it. Then the Arashi destroyer comes back, trying to head to the fleet. And that's where McCluskey, who's flying in, sees that destroyer and uses it to pinpoint the fleet that he would have otherwise missed. So that's all there. Then they show the ineffectual, you know, torpedo bombers, followed by the dual attacks of the dive bombers that come in, knock out three of the carriers. My main gripe with this scene is that it's done in a little bit too quick of succession. You don't really get to feel the sense of, uh, I, I don't know, it was just moving too quickly. You didn't get to linger on what was happening, and especially, you didn't really get a sense of the directions that they were coming in, or they, they completely omitted the, the, uh, the, the flight to nowhere, they omitted um, this uh, luck as it being a huge factor. As much as it was, it seemed a little bit more coordinated and put together in the film, so they downplayed that a little bit. But that's it basically for the Battle of Midway. Uh, then they wrap it up with the Hiryu attacking the Yorktown. Unfortunately, in the film, they only depict that event as being, you know, one Japanese attack on the Yorktown, which the Japanese report as, oh, we sunk one ship, Yamamoto therefore thinking that, oh, maybe we still have this. Whereas in reality, it was even worse than that. The Japanese launched an attack, uh, attacked the Yorktown, retreated, reported that they'd sunk the Yorktown. When they come back out to get more, the Yorktown had actually been fixed to the point that they thought it was a new carrier. That second strike group, again, strikes the Yorktown, comes back and report that they've hit two carriers. And that was omitted from the film, so that was a bit unfortunate. Uh, but I can see why they omitted a lot of these kind of confusing factors. And then after that, the film wraps up a bit with Yamamoto thinking, oh, maybe we can, you know, 
uh, draw the U.S. carriers into our battleships and then blow them up, but no, uh, the U.S. fleet decides to retreat and call it quits, you know, take their gain, gains to the bank and, and cash in. So that's where the movie ends. Uh, and then you have a little bit of a homecoming, you have something where the characters, you know, the cliche where the characters are moved, then freeze frame, and you get a historical fact about this character won this award and went on to do this. So you get a little bit of that. So it's a little bit cheesy at the end, um, but it's a good way to kind of do a send-off to the history. Um, so yeah, overall, I would say it's a big list of historical pluses with a couple little nitpicks here and there. But overall, like I said, my main takeaway is it almost looks like it's a film that you or I would make as history nerds. And it almost plays out like a documentary minus the maps and the omniscient voice. So that's it. Now you've seen my review of the film and the historical critique. Uh, if you want to learn more about Midway, definitely check out my documentary. Or if you want to learn even more about Midway, check out Shattered Sword. I've only just begun to read it, but this is a game changer when it comes to understanding Midway. It uses a lot more records from the Japanese side and corrects a lot of misconceptions. Uh, about what happened in the battle. Some of them were actually incorrect in my documentary, according to this book, and incorrect in the movie. So if you want to learn more about some of those nitpicks or the nuances, definitely check out Shattered Sword. Uh, it is worth a read. So anyways, that's it. Hope you guys enjoyed this review, and if you like this type of content, maybe I'll do more. So yeah, see you in the next one. Peace out.